a, a, a Giants podcast for Giants fans. By Giants fans. It's Sean Morash. On the sideline, into the end zone. Touchdown, Giants! From the offseason, through the wins and the losses, it's time to take one, one, one Giant Giants Giant step. step. Draft month is upon us. It's one giant step here, always free on the Odyssey app and everywhere podcasts are available. My lovely raspy whiny voice is Sean Morash back with you with my Giants concierge, Bryce Gelman, to steal a John Sterling, Susan Waldman line. Brycey, baby, it's draft month. And just like that, you look up, wait, you three weeks to go to the draft. Uh, I am tepidly fired up. I got to be honest with you, and I'm curious where you are as well. The sixth overall pick, which we are going to discuss at nauseum over the next three weeks and over the next few minutes as well, and where the Giants sit, I I think has me less juiced than I should be. Uh, Let's just start there. Are you fired up for the draft three weeks away, or are you just kind of still, you know, putting this into gear ahead of time? So I got to echo that sentiment of, not being as juiced up as I have been in prior years. Last year was different because they had a late first round pick and there's nothing to really be excited about, but that's kind of where you want to be. And yeah, well, I was going to say you're excited because they're a playoff team. Exactly. Ahead, exactly. You know, exactly. So, yeah, I actually exactly. was way more excited at this point last year for the draft than I was this year. And obviously the year before when they have two top 10 picks. So I'm glad to hear you. You're going there. What's your theory on why you feel that way? This is different. This is just different because they're kind of in that middle ground where you're not excited that you're going to get one of those top three quarterbacks. There are a lot of other moving parts around you that you kind of want to let play out. You want a lot of a team like the Vikings, the Broncos trade up to four or five to, you know, figure out the rest of the draft for you. You want whoever, you know, neighbors or Dunze to, to fall to fall to you at six. That's why they don't really control their destiny, in my opinion. I think if they wanted to go out and draft the quarterback, if J.J. McCarthy falls to six, we'll talk about it, then they do control their destiny. But as of right now, I'm not nervous. I don't have anxiety about this draft because I think it's going to play out however it's going to play out. The Giants are going to get their star receiver. If they end up with McCarthy, that's a different story. I don't think that that's going to happen. It might. I don't think it will. I just think that either way, they will – end up better than they were before and another team will jump ahead of them and make that mistake with McCarthy and hopefully they aren't the team to do that so interesting interesting way to lay that out we're going to get to all the J.J. McCarthy buzz the Drake May stuff and everything in just a moment but you hit on something and maybe that's my feeling maybe it's not a lack of excitement I have a lack of anxiety about this draft and you go back to past giant drafts to Daniel Jones draft. Are they going to take a quarterback? Are they going to take Josh Allen? Are they going to take Dwayne Haskins at the time? Uh, the Saquon draft and, and obviously the cave on Neil draft. Everybody knew they were coming out of there with an offensive lineman. I think we were all stunned that they got cave on at five that year, but that was just pure anxiousness slash excitement because it was two picks in that spot. Then there was the Devontae Smith year where they ended up getting jumped by the Eagles and traded back, but still that year had some juice as well. Uh, entering year number two with Joe Judge. I think that's it. I- I'm not anxious about this draft because I kind of feel like the Giants are going to, A, I kind of know what they're going to do, right? They're either going to have a quarterback somehow miraculously fall to six, or they're going to trade up for a quarterback, or they are going to end up with one of the top three wide receivers, which is also a massive need for this team. So I am obviously intrigued as a Giant fan as to what exactly happens, but I don't really have anxiousness. And maybe that's a credit and a testament to Joe Shane and Brian Dable, and maybe I'm an idiot as well, but I have so so much trust in them, maybe unwarranted, but they they just feel like they know what they're doing. And I have kind of, as I've matured, Gone away from the fact that, yeah, I watch a ton of college football. I've seen a ton of these guys. I have my opinions on all of these players, uh, the quarterbacks, the wide receivers. But push come to shove, I'm a fat, loud mouth with a microphone. I am not somebody in there who is studying how this transfers to the NFL. I have been wrong on players before. I will be wrong on players again. I've been right on some. But I think just my trust in knowing that I do think that this this tandem of Shane and Dable will do what's right for them, the future of the organization and everything. And that takes away the anxiety. Throw in the fact that we're living in a town right now, you know, hat tip to uh, Juan Soto's Yankees, which are tearing it up right now. Time of taking yeah, right. uh, the Rangers and Knicks marching towards the postseason, although the Knicks obviously hitting some stuff. There's been some other juice around here in New York 
that has allowed us to take a sigh of relief as we approach the draft. But nonetheless, this is the time they revved up. You're downloading and you're subscribing to One Giant Step because you want to hear our thoughts on it. So with that, I, I kind of laid the groundwork on no anxiousness, as Bryce pointed it out, trusting this regime. And that sets up the idea of at sixth overall, the value versus the quarterback. And that's a very interesting conversation to have, Bryce, because look, you can listen to every New York Giants podcast in North America or the world. You can watch every Giant game and walk into a sports bar in the tri-state area and argue Giant football. And undoubtedly, the biggest lightning rod argument, as it's been for five years, is going to be Daniel Jones. And I don't think that this is arguable. You can like and love Daniel Jones, the player, and believe that what you saw in 2022 is only the beginning. That's fine. I absolutely can hear that argument. In fact, I tend to lean towards it. You can think that Daniel Jones was always had his ceiling and the best we ever will see is 2022 and he's never got, that's fine. And by the way, the track record tells you that you could blame the offensive line woes, which are real. Just because you're tired of arguing about the offensive line doesn't mean the offensive line problems didn't exist. They of course existed. Daniel Jones didn't walk into a lot of his own sacks. He was getting rocked back there. But I think the one thing that we will hammer home and continue to hammer home is the one thing that is inarguable is Daniel Jones's injury history. And more specifically than the ACL, two neck injuries in three years. And if you're really putting a stock in the future in Daniel Jones, a quarterback, well, what's to say even on one awkward hit, even if the offensive line is fixed, he doesn't re-injure his neck. And then that's basically it, because how could you continue to put a guy back there with three neck injuries? So it's just the trust of availability on Daniel Jones for me that tells me that this team needs to move on also in this world of salary cap. Is it fake? Is it real? You know, they had a very important out put in that contract to not kill the Giants cap wise after this season. So, yeah, they can get by for a year and then decide on a quarterback next year. But of course, as we stand right now, the quarterbacks next year are not as rich as the quarterbacks this year. But do you force a quarterback that you don't necessarily love with a potential ticking clock on you as the general manager and coach? When you know you have a good opportunity at sixth in a rare situation to walk away with arguably one of the three or four best players in the draft by taking one of the three big wide receivers, namely Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr., or Rome Adunze. I have to say this, Bryce. If this team has a quarterback fall to their left, maybe Drake May slides. Uh, we'll argue McCarthy in a second. Maybe Drake May slides. Fine. Maybe they trade up to four and and because McCarthy was taken by the Pats or something like that, and it's May or Daniels that slides. Fine. I'm I'm on board because I get it, right? You, your lifeblood is the quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. We're taping this hours after the Texans have traded for Stephon Diggs. Why are they able to do that? They hit on the quarterback on the draft. It's amazing how holes get filled. For all those who argue, oh, you got to fill this, that, and the other hole. You hit on the quarterback, suddenly holes get filled real quick. But if the quarterback you don't love is there, yes, Daniel Jones is still in the contract. Yes, he signed Drew Locke minimal money. Yes, Tommy Cutlets is still sitting around there. The Giants can walk away with a unbelievably stud like number one type wide receiver uh, of the likes they haven't seen since Odell Beckham Jr. Maybe they will be less flash here. Look at the Seattle Seahawks. You think they knew they were going to stumble into something with Geno Smith. You know why they're functionable on offense. Geno Smith walked into a situation with DK Metcalf as his number one wide receiver because they hit that. That is just something for me. Uh, I think as it stands right now, Bryce, I'm going to be good either way, but I tend at the moment to lean. You know what? You can't not walk away with a short thing, and the short thing is the wide receiver. Where are you at? That's exactly where I'm at as well. I think that if I'm the Giants and the way I look at it, you can't draft a quarterback unless you're completely entrenched in your belief that that quarterback will be a stud. And if you don't subscribe to that belief, if you decide to force it and take that quarterback, that's front office malpractice, Sean. The Giants go out and they're like, well, we're screwed next year. There's no quarterback in the next in the next draft class, but look, wow, look at this draft class. There's three in the top in the yeah. top three that are gonna be picked. Let's get our quarterback. Let's let's go out and draft JJ McCarthy at six. Let's force our own hand and draft JJ McCarthy and see how it plays out. What is going to happen, Sean? We are going to be yeah. sitting back here in a year doing the day with the Jones top Jones. three pick. With the top three pick with JJ McCarthy slotted in there as where did we go wrong? You know, Bryce. I can't deal with that again. Bryce, that's actually a great point, and that just furthers the idea of being in Giants no man's land and something I hadn't considered. Me and you clearly don't like J.J. McCarthy, but I'm ready to be proven wrong if he is good in the NFL because, look. I don't I'm like him at six. 
I don't like right. him at six. I like him at twelve. I like him at fifteen. Right. I like him at thirty before all this draft hype that all of a sudden no. right. pops up, six, pops him six, up out of nowhere. Six when you can walk away with one of those wide receivers. But you're right. If they take JJ McCarthy at six, there is a good chance that this team is picking top five again. And then we might all be sitting there going, "Wow, Quinn Ewers or Shador Sanders, they look a lot better than JJ yeah. McCarthy." But can we do that? Uh, and that is exactly where you could find yourself in trouble. So I, I'm with you. Let me run another one by. So we're both in lockstep before we argue the actual quarterbacks. Do you think it's a wasted bullet with your second round pick or dare I say using a second and let's say a fourth or a fifth to move back to 32, 31 and take a Michael Penix? Do you think that's a wasted bullet? Because then you're also saying that's the quarterback we are going to put stock in. Because I, I got to be honest with you. I would be interested in that. If you paired him with with the number one wide receiver on your board and, and you walked away like that, I think that's the best scenario where I walk away kind of giddy. Wow, they believed in Penix. They played the board right, something like that. I do understand his injury history. I do understand that starting Evan Neal at right tackle with him as a left-handed quarterback could be a recipe for disaster. But I am definitely – I'm way more intrigued by that than taking J.J. McCarthy. Sean, it kind of brings me back to what I said when you first asked me that question. They need to be fully entrenched. That that quarterback they want to trade up for in the start of the second round is going to be their quarterback of the future because you trade some assets to trade up in the second round. That second, that mid second round pick they have from the Seahawks is gone. Their third round pick is gone. Hopefully they can hold on to their fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever. They do that. They're completely punting on building a secondary because as of right, right now, who do you have? Trey Hawkins. Is your is right. your quarterback too? Cordell Flott. That's a disaster waiting Nick to McLeod, happen. Baby. In, Nick McLeod, baby. Nick McLeod. It's a disaster waiting to happen. You got to face AJ Brown. You got to face Devontae Smith. You got to face CeeDee Lamb twice a year. I could not have a secondary that bad. If you want to be competitive, especially with how good the Giants front seven is shaping up to be, how can you possibly punt on that other half of your defense? And then what are you going to do? You're going to give up your assets next year? To acquire a yeah. cornerback this year, because as of right now, understood the Giants won six games. Okay. The Giants were not in a position to make the playoffs. They don't have as much hype going into this upcoming year as they had last year. But when you go out and trade for Brian Burns, when they do whatever they did and in, and in, in, in building their defensive line, in building their offensive line in the offseason. You can't just forget about one position group. I understand quarterback changes everything, but it's a completely different story when you're trading up to the start of the second round because there's no guarantee that that guy could right. turn into the guy that we're talking about for the next 10 years on this podcast. Like I, I don't, I don't foresee a future where the giants make a crazy splash. Like a M Lamar Jackson, Splash. That's the guy that was at the end of the first round pick. That was a guy not a lot of people in the first round. But that's a guy exactly. But the Ravens in it. The Ravens did. They believed in him. They believed in him. They they knew that they could build a system around him. If the Giants don't have that guy, they can't force it on Penix. They can't force it. I mean, I think that Bo Nix will be there with their second round pick. I don't know about you. Maybe Bo Nix might go early because everyone's like, I need to get a quarterback. Bryce, Bryce, Bryce. Put it this way though. If the Giants do do that, and whether it's Knicks or Penix or whatever, whatever we think of them actually should be irrelevant here in many ways because it's about what Joe Shane and Brian Dable think. I don't think they're pulling the trigger by trading up late in the first round or using a second a second round pick as a starter in any other position. I don't yeah. think they're doing that without the conviction that they think that quarterback can and will be their starter of the future. I really don't. You know, this isn't Good like point. taking Spencer Rattler in the fourth round. So if they do it, the reason I'd be excited is they played the board the way they wanted, and that's actually the guy that they wanted along. Because I think once those top quarterbacks go off the board, if they go quarterback again in or decide to take their quarterback round two, I don't think you could spend that pick thinking that guy is going to be your, you know, your top backup down the line. That has to be a guy that you think is going to be a starter. We saw Jalen Hurts go in the second round. You would think that that's a guy they believe in. So I'd be kidding. Now you bring up cornerback. You're right. That's obviously the next position to need for the Giants. I would argue D tackle a little bit as well. But remember, last year we entered the season with Trey Hawkins starting week one because of the great camp he had. That is a Joe Shane pick late in the uh, sixth round last year. Okay. Now six rounders don't normally turn into starters, but liked them enough and impressed enough. I can't give up on Joe Shane in that spot. And Cordell Flott, a third round pick. 
a third round pick of Joe Shane just two years ago. So, and Nick McLeod, a guy who he had in Buffalo, who he signed. So I'm not telling you these are household names by any means, but at this point we have rid ourselves of Dave Gettleman guys. These are all, whether they're big or little investments, investments and handpicked guys by Joe Shane in the cornerback room. And Deontay Banks is clearly the guy you drift in the first one to be a first pick. So we may not like that group. I thought the Giants would walk away. I thought they'd be more involved with Xavier Howard, somebody like that. I thought we would walk away with another corner in this offseason. But the more that this goes by, maybe that is the pick in round two. Maybe they take another dart in round three. But I ultimately think that the Giants like their cornerback room uh, and clearly like it better than we think. And by the way, I'm okay to be surprised. And when you add a second pass rusher like that, now Aziz Ojolari is the third pass rusher. Best way to negate bad corner play, get to the quarterback early. The Giants have let quarterback stand in pocket forever. Kayvon Thibodeau, Brian Burns, Dexter Lawrence up front, maybe sub packages where Ojolari on the field at the same time. You can't block all those guys. Somebody's getting home. I think the, the time to throw is going to be way less here for opposing quarterbacks. So I, I think the team would value quarter over corner. But they're not yeah. going to force quarter, if that makes sense. The one other thing I'll say about that, and then we can move on, is maybe there's just a chance that they look at this roster and they don't see a possibility where they can improve as much as they want to actually compete this upcoming year, where they value getting the quarterback first and then fixing the secondary down the line. So that may be their mindset. They may not love their cornerback room. They may just be like, well, screw it. Look at all these guys we have in the front seven. Let's get to the quarterback, as you said, and let's worry about that at another date. I don't think that that's the smart move if you're going to invest as much as they invested in their defensive line. Uh, but that could be a possibility. That could be their mindset right now about the cornerback. I still think that they'll go out and they'll use the third, the fourth round pick to bolster their secondary. They, have, they really have no choice. I mean, they, they need to take a flyer on, on one of these guys in the third and fourth round. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if that's their mindset, then maybe they're just going to punt on this upcoming year. I mean, if they're not fully invested in going out and finding some replacements at secondary with the secondary, then maybe they're just looking at this team differently than we're all looking at it. Yeah. Or, or, or believing differently or believing differently. Yeah. Either way, I think it's interesting. Now, we did discuss a little bit on J.J. McCarthy. We kind of revealed some feelings on here. I'm curious, Bryce, as we look at the actual quarterbacks in this draft, have you – I know this is the first time you're doing a Giants podcast around this, but you've been a Giants fan. This is like the fourth year I think I'm doing draft uh, with Odyssey and, and looking ahead to the Giants pick. So I have had my feelings on quarterbacks and, and everything. And I, as I mentioned, the one I've – always go back to that I got wrong was Josh Rosen. I thought he'd be really good. I thought Johnny Manziel would be really good. I've clearly had a bad read. Well, I mean, that was, that was, no, that was yeah. mental. I, Johnny Manziel might've been a good quarterback if it weren't for the off the field stuff. That's yeah. another story for another. I knew Mac Jones would stink. I got that right. So I, when I, a couple of them out there, I knew Zach Wilson would stink. I got that right. I, as it sits right now, I have this underlying feeling that a lot of the JJ McCarthy smoke is almost fabricated by two things. I think there's a split in the middle. Number one, we live in a world where everybody is so starved for media creation, media attention. You want to have something to talk about. And I think that we have found such an oddball year where it was such a quarterback heavy drift to begin with, combined with the fact that the top three teams, how rare is this, actually all have an extreme need at quarterback. Usually a team's going after a pass rush or something like that. And I think we got to the point after the combine where it was almost like stale for people, Daniel Jeremiah's, Bucky Brooks, uh, Dane Brugler's, all the guys we love and follow when we read their mock drafts, everybody at CBS, that it almost got stale, the idea that we just knew the top three picks were going to go three quarterbacks. And then you throw in the fact that if you were the Cardinals or the Chargers and you really wanted one of these wide receivers, well, now you're going to start leaking information out about like Harbaugh knows J.J. McCarthy well, how great he is, send everybody to the pro day. I think you have a tale of two worlds. Guys who have a job to do to make their job interesting because suddenly draft coverage got boring when the top three picks feel like the three quarterbacks and teams after those three that want to you know find a way for a team either to trade up because they want assets or to make sure they have the pick of the best player in the draft who isn't a quarterback. So I'm not sure the J.J. McCarthy hype's even real. I have to be honest with you. I'm not sure the J.J. McCarthy hype is actually real. I do think he sizzled at his pro day. I think there's buzz. But it feels like 
there might be teams like the Giants, like the Vikings, that actually want the Patriots or the Commanders to fall in love with J.J. McCarthy to make the real guys they want, Drake May and Jane Daniels, fall, and or the Chargers and Harbaugh want to tell everybody how great J.J. McCarthy is so that a team jumps up and trades with the Cardinals so that they can have the pick of the top wide receiver. I would not be shocked if we got the draft day. And just what my eyes told me watching all these Michigan games, we go back yep. to that J.J. McCarthy is going to slide in this draft. And yep. I would not shock me if J.J. McCarthy is there at sixth overall and the Giants pass on him. That wouldn't shock me at all. It's interesting you bring that up. I, because I was not thinking of that like that. I, I wasn't. The, the one thing that I thought was a little fishy was all the stuff that Jim Harbaugh has been saying about him. I know it's his guy. Yeah, he, he, he was the head coach at Michigan. He's going to support his guy. But it looks a little fishy when you realize that he's got the fifth overall pick. And if McCarthy, someone trades up and gets McCarthy at four, who does he end up with? A generational wide receiver for his already stud quarterback. So that was the one thing. That was like, okay, well, maybe maybe he's just trying to meddle here and, and trying to get a team to, to make that mistake. But he knows him best, so maybe that's just him supporting his guy. I think everything else could come to fruition, Sean, now that you say it, thinking about it, because there's a lot of BS out there. There's a lot of guys calling up reporters and telling them to report something to keep them – you know, with the reporters are going to do it because they want to stay in good favor with these front offices. But you're right. You're completely right. I think the one thing that shows me that maybe there is some real interest in that is how many mock drafts have people, teams, right. trading up for McCarthy. I don't think if it was it feels like smoke, man. BS, That's my big smoke know. screen season. I think J.J. McCarthy screams smoke screen season. It's a combination of all of these things. I, I I just I don't buy it. And by the way, every so and every team's meeting with every single year yeah. has some kind of draft slide or draft rise that's a surprise. And I think a lot of people are sitting right now, three weeks outside of the draft, thinking the JJ McCarthy rise is the biggest surprise. And I think that's sure. that hype is going to continue to build. That I think the biggest surprise of the draft is actually going to be the JJ McCarthy slide. And I think the Vikings do end up or the Broncos end up with JJ McCarthy. And I think he's picked after the Giants pick. I think the Giants sure. could pass on him at six. I just don't – what I don't get is the fact that the Giants have now seen him four times. They called him back for another private workout on Easter. Well, on dude, Easter Sunday. By the way, he's, by the way is that, does that not scream with your screen? Really? I mean, like, they're going to tell the kid that he can't be, he can't hang out with his family on Easter Sunday because you got to come and work out for us again? And we got to see you for the fourth time? Are we really talking about smokescreen as being like, hey, you can't, you can't, even the Giants, they they couldn't hang, like, Brian Dable couldn't go home and hang out with his family because I got to look at J.J. McCarthy for the fourth time. How many more times you got to see him? I, Dude, I just think if you're going to do any smokescreen, making sure that you're that interested in a guy on Easter Sunday screams, you know, we are interested. Make another team trade up in front of you. Make the Vikings trip the four. Well, if you're the Giants too, by the way. You're not stuck with the third wide receiver if the Vikings trade up with the Cardinals to four. You get the second wide receiver off the board. It's all smokescreen season. When Dave Gettleman was making picks, you knew exactly where and what the do. You wouldn't even take calls on number two overall when they took Saquon Barkley. I think Shane plays it right. Uh, that's my bold draft prediction. As it Maybe I'll change my mind another week when we do this. My bold giant prediction is the Giants will not draft J.J. McCarthy if he's there, and everything they've done with J.J. McCarthy is a flat-out smoke screen. But because you think that they want another team to jump them. Yeah, and I take think so. McCarthy because they're really, and I think the Chargers I mean, want that too. I mean, I, the last thing the Chargers and Giants want is the Cardinals sitting there and taking either Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. They're going to want their pick of the two. I mean, it's such a toss up. Like, where, yeah, like where there's smoke, there usually is fire in terms of them trying to BS other teams, but there could be smoke where there's fire with teams I've watched too many having these. some interest. I've watched too many of these drafts unfold to not look back and go, oh, that was so full of crap. And I, I just, J.J. McCarthy, that's the best way to put this headline. J.J. McCarthy's rise is full of crap. Okay, I'm just going to say it. It is absolutely full. Is that, is, that, is, that what, is that what I should title this podcast? Well, I don't is know. Is that what it should clip, be? Clip it, put it out there. We'll see. Uh, with that, Bryce Gelman, I'm going to tip my cap. 
I'm going to get ready for my regular duties on Evan and Tiki Monday through Friday, 2 to 6.20 on WFAN and free on the Odyssey app. Bryce Gelman, always catch him here on One Giant Step Free on the Odyssey app, WFAN's YouTube page as well. You can follow Bryce Gelman on Twitter, at Bryce Gelman, G-E-L-M-A-N. Not two L's there. there you go. And follow there me go. on Twitter, X, at Sean Morash. Draft season's upon us. Keep it locked. You want to download and subscribe to One Giant Step because the days we may be recording these could vary week to week. News could happen. Maybe the Giants make a trade. How do you ensure that you get our reaction to that? Download, subscribe. Every time we drop a pod, it'll pop right up, right into your earbuds. Go for your dog walk. Go for your ride in the car. Go for your jog. You got our two lovely voices breaking down New York Giants football. And, of course, in this month, the New York Giants ahead of the NFL draft. So we'll be back with you each of the next couple weeks leading up to the draft. And, of course, of course, reaction to the draft will happen after. Do we do, you know, a pod on uh, Friday morning reacting to the first round? Perhaps. Do we do a pod? Uh, well, we will the following Sunday or Monday as we recap the entire draft, of course. So we will keep it right locked with you. Another three, four episodes of draft coverage, two and on the back end, coming your way with Bryce and myself. Again, free on the Odyssey app everywhere. Podcasts are available. Thank you, everybody, for taking one giant step with us.